Well, I, I'm the one that really needs to say thank you because it's it's a rare opportunity that uh, I get a, a chance to speak to people that actually want to come hear me talk uh, versus my students at my nine o'clock class. Um, so while my talk today addresses uh, a, a history full of tragedy, and this is, you know, by the topic, you can tell that this is not a, a feel-good uh, story that I want to talk about today. But I don't want to lose sight of the fact that we are now celebrating in this month of November, indigenous communities and the remarkable story of resilience and survival. So I want to pay my respects and honor to the native peoples whose ancestral lands we are on today, the Onkachuks. I give you thanks as well to all the native peoples who have lived and continue to live on Long Island, including um, the Shinnecock, Montucket, and Matinecock peoples. Um, I also, I'd be remiss not to thank the uh, Robert David Lyon Gardner Foundation for uh, funding the chair that I currently have that allowed me to move to Stony Brook University, and I'm very fortunate to be here. Uh, and of course, I want to thank the library. Uh, in particular, Mona, thank you very much for inviting me to come speak. Um, this is quite an honor, and I guess now it's kind of the pressure's on since I'm the, the guinea pig here. Uh, but I do appreciate being asked to participate and all that you and your staff have done to make this happen. And thank you all for coming out today. Uh, the idea behind this talk uh, occurred to me uh, in the fall of 2015, at the beginning of the term, and it occurred to me after learning of an incident that occurred in a classroom at California State University, Sacramento. In this classroom, a Diné student took issue with a lecture by her professor. The instructor, in his own words, stated, I do not like to use the term genocide because genocide is something that is done on purpose. But needless to say, European diseases primarily will wipe out Native American populations in the two continents. The following class period, the student came back and challenged this notion that genocide does not apply. I told him, she stated, you said genocide implies the purposeful extermination of people and that they were mostly wiped out by European diseases. That is not a true statement. A back and forth ensued with the professor eventually, according to the student, threatening to expel her from the class. Now, when I first learned of this incident, I wasn't surprised. It is another example of what I call the germs versus genocide debate. And it revolves around this question. Did an unintended introduction of novel diseases to the Americas depopulate indigenous peoples to such an extent that genocide becomes a wholly inappropriate term to use to describe their fate. Now this debate has had a profound importance in competing narratives of American history. For some, germs played such a role that no discussion of genocide should take place. While for others, the magnitude of indigenous depopulation makes using the term genocide not only appropriate when discussing a few isolated events, but also when generalizing for the collective whole. Now what I want to do today is discuss the evolution of this debate and show how it has unfortunately continued without reference to a growing body of scholarship that has clarified the role of introduced diseases in indigenous history. What I will argue is that revisionist scholars, a group to which I belong, have reshaped our understanding of the role of diseases in facilitating European success and indigenous depopulation. This reshaping puts germs in a broader colonial context and prevents the wholesale dismissal of the term genocide from the scholarly vocabulary we use in American history. In other words, the Diné student who challenged her professor was right. She expressed views that correspond more closely to recent scholarship. So my presentation indeed asserts that germs have been misunderstood and that the term genocide deserves consideration in how we narrate American history. Now, after sketching out the evolution of this debate, uh, I will give three examples to illustrate my argument. Uh, these examples, while grounded in archival research, I believe encourage a broader audience to question prevailing mythologies, particularly those that obscure the darker, more troubling lessons that American history can teach. So a good starting point for this is with um, a work by Alfred Crosby. And I'm going to project a lot of book covers, and we're in the library, I thought that would be appropriate. So I'm going to talk a lot about books and what's been published. 
and journal articles. So in 1976, Alfred Crosby published this article called Virgin Soil Epidemics. Uh, and it's often referred to as the virgin soil thesis. It crystallized a lot of thinking scholars had about the impact of infectious diseases on native peoples. Crosby points to native bodies as being, as he says, immunologically almost defenseless because common diseases of the Eastern Hemisphere were absent from the Americas prior to 1492. Native populations thus did not have the opportunity to acquire immunity to those diseases. And thus, when these diseases were introduced to this inexperienced population, catastrophic epidemics occurred. Now, according to the virgin soil thesis, diseases, particularly smallpox, spread like wildfire, even outpacing the colonizers and igniting outbreaks that went unrecorded. The demise of indigenous peoples thus was a historical accident. The colonizers exercised little agency in this catastrophe, yet were its unwitting beneficiaries. Or as he says in his uh, magnum opus in 1986, basically you just have to point to disease that can explain the success of Europeans in taking over the Americas. Now Crosby wasn't alone and he had tremendous influence, but he was also influenced by the anthropologist Henry Dobbins. He published works on Native American de demography beginning in the 1960s and continuing up until the 1990s. Dobbins postulated that a series of undocumented pandemics swept the Americas as early as the 1520s, and based on this postulation, he tried to convince his colleagues that America's aboriginal population was much larger than previously thought. He made the argument that indigenous population of all the Americas was something like of the magnitude of 112 or 114 million people, when at the time, this is back in the 1960s when he's first doing this, uh, consensus was that the population was about 14 million. Uh, and this population was this high because scholars had ignored the impact of infectious diseases. And so he postulates these series of epidemics that swept the Americas, creating a catastrophe. In particular, he cites the introduction of smallpox in 1518, which he believed uh, swept into Mexico, down into South America, and up through North America, stretching from Canada to Chile. Dobbins stated the disease spread like wildfire through a Native American population that was 100% susceptible. Now, popular works have incorporated this idea in their Scott in uh, as well. Uh, some of you probably have read Guns, Germs, and Steel, uh, which won the Pulitzer Prize in history, although. Jerry Diamond's not a historian. Uh, nonetheless, he incorporated this idea that diseases alone explains European success. Some of you may be familiar with the journalist Charles Mann's popular works on uh, the European conquest. His work, 1491, uh, shows native populations much larger than previously thought, using Dobbins' idea, and then he uses the idea that diseases spread like wildfire, or as he uses, a more colorful imagery like ink spreading through tissue paper. He's referring to smallpox supposedly spreading down into the Incan Empire well before the Spanish ever arrived. The scholarship of Crosby and Dobbins has had an important impact and has become a political football in the germs versus genocide debate. Those on both sides of the issue have used the works of Crosby and Dobbins to bolster their respective arguments. Now, among scholarly works that claim genocide is an appropriate term to use, David Standard's 1992 book, American Holocaust, The Con Conquest of the New World, drew the most attention published in 1992 in the Columbian Quincentenary by Oxford University Press. Standard did not hold back in his charge of genocide. As you can see by this quote, what happened to the indigenous people is the greatest genocide ever known in history. Of course, to make this claim, he has to use the work of Henry Dobbins, the high count, the large numbers of native peoples. <clears throat> Backing up, I guess you didn't see the quote, did you? <laughs> okay. So backing up Standard's work is another um, professor. And this, of course, is Ward Churchill. 
who at the time was a professor of ethnic studies at the University of Colorado. He took off where Standard left off. In his 1997 book, A Little Matter of Genocide, Churchill relied on the high counts of Dobbins and cites Dobbins' works to bolster his claim that the genocide inflicted upon American Indians over the past five centuries is unparalleled in human history, both in terms of its sheer magnitude and its duration. Unlike Standard, however, he argued that much of the indigenous experience with diseases stemmed from deliberate attempts of Europeans and their Euro-American descendants to infect natives. For Churchill, the documented episode of the British delivering smallpox-laden materials to Lenape's visiting Fort Pitt in 1763 was the smoking gun that demonstrated widespread efforts of biological warfare. I'll talk about that particular episode later in the talk. But for um, Churchill, this was just one of many efforts, including the English deliberately infecting Narragansetts in 1633, and the U.S. Army supposedly dispensing smallpox-laden blankets to Mandans in 1837. Now, Churchill, as some of you may know, became a national center of controversy after his comments about 9-11 victims, and because of this, uh, his scholarship was investigated, and he was eventually fired. Uh, the investigation found serious problems with his scholarship. He miscited sources, he plagiarized, and he fabricated evidence especially when it came to his conclusions about germ warfare. Churchill's downfall became fodder for those who wanted to keep the term genocide out of the narrative of American history. Leading figures in the American historical profession were far from convinced from either Churchill's or Standard's claim. Obviously, they're both using the high counts of Henry Dobbins and arguing that genocide happened, but Dobbin's high counts are predicated on the spread of diseases spreading by themselves without human agency. The most biting criticism against Churchill and Standard came from a group of scholars that are focused on the Holocaust. To say the least, Standard's expropriation of the word Holocaust and his disrespectful hyperbole did not set well with many. In response to Standard and Churchill, however, opponents to the inclusion of genocide into the vocabulary used to narrate American history diminished the violence waged against Native peoples in order to assert that the Holocaust was a unique event, unrelated in its origins, processes, or outcomes to other episodes of mass human extermination. And in making this case for uniqueness, they found the virgin soil thesis particularly useful. The conservative political scientist, Gerter Louis, for example, used the virgin soil thesis to bolster his argument for a more celebratory version of Europe's discovery and colonization of America. For Louis, one can only conclude that genocide happened if there was a clear intent to do so, and in the case of American Indians, there was no intent to destroy them in whole or in part. The mass destruction they did suffer instead was a result of in his words, highly contagious diseases to which they had no immunity. In making this statement, Louis did not do any more than more serious scholars had done before, but he did not stop there. He went to great lengths to dismiss native suffering. Consider this passage in an essay he penned in the Journal of Genocide Studies. True, the forced relocations of Indian tribes were often accompanied by great hardship and harsh treatment. The removal of the Cherokee from their homelands to territories west of the Mississippi took the lives of thousands and has entered history as the Trail of Tears. However, the largest loss of life occurred well before the creation of the reservations, and some of the most severe epidemics hit the Indians after minimal contact with European traders. So with two sentences, Louis wiped away Indian removal as a crime against humanity with vague references to epidemics that hit unspecified natives at unspecified times. Then he does it again with the Sand Creek Massacre, a horrid event in 1864 in which the 3rd Colorado Cavalry attacked a peaceful southern Cheyenne village, killing between 150 and 270 men, women, and children. Louis mentions this atrocity and then immediately states, it is well to remember that a far larger number of Indians died from the epidemic diseases unintentionally introduced and spread by the white man from outright violence. 
Louis uses germs far outside of the context of Southern Cheyenne history to put their horrible suffering on the sidelines of historical relevance. So as of now, it would seem that the genocide or germs debate has yet to be put to rest. Whenever an effort is made to use the term genocide in context of describing the fate of America's indigenous peoples, a reaction ensues that depends heavily on the virgin soil thesis to silence this effort. And there's many more examples that I could bring up to illustrate this germs versus genocide um, debate. You, you may not be able to read it here, but um, a few years ago during the debate on the revision of the AP U.S. History Standards to include a more critical view of uh, Manifest Destiny, uh, conservatives reacted to that and wanted a more uh, celebratory history promoted. Uh, and that, of course, generated a lot of discussion. And this is some of the discussion in an Inside Higher Education article. Uh, the first person says, what, you can't teach that genocide happened? And uh, then, of course, inevitably someone says, no, it wasn't genocide, it was microbes, it was diseases. So this reaction even lingers in even more rigorous and serious recent scholarship. Scholarship that's moved well beyond the polemics of Standard and Churchill on one side and the polemics of Louis and others on the other side. A debate between Ben Madley and Gary Anderson, history professors at UCLA and Oklahoma respectively, highlight the continuing legacy of the germs versus genocide debate. Madley's 2016 book, An American Genocide, makes a quite compelling case that in California, several instances of violence against Native peoples between 1849 and the 1870s fit the UN definition of genocide. Now, scholars have long casually stated that genocide occurred in California, but Madley has meticulously gathered and marshaled evidence to make the case. He uses the UN definition, and he indicts California officials from the governor on down who made statements of clear intent that the Indian race ought to be exterminated. The California legislature reimbursed private citizens for hunting natives, and they funded militia campaigns on exterminatory raids. The U.S. government failed to intervene, and in fact, reimbursed California for much of its expenses. Madley's work has larger implications beyond what happened in Gold Rush, California. He points, for example, to the fallacy that many make by lumping all Native groups into one category, and then concluding that because some groups did not experience genocide, then the term has no place. So if the Choctaws didn't experience genocide, then you couldn't consider then the Yuki of California to experience genocide. But such lumping and then denial is insulting to Native communities of today, such as the Yuki, whose descendants endured what Madley has documented as the worst of crimes against humanity. Gary Anderson's 2014 book, though, uh, tries to make uh, a different argument. And it stands as a stark reminder of the power of the virgin soil thesis in efforts to keep the term genocide out of narratives of American history. Anderson makes a two-fold argument. He doesn't sanitize U.S. colonialism. He believes ethnic cleansing happened repetitively, but yet he says genocide never occurred. To do this, Anderson construes the U.N. definition of genocide more narrowly and claims that prosecutors must prove that a policy authorizing such an action had been adopted by a government or governmental agency. We may, of course, take issue with Anderson's narrow reading, and we rightfully should. But for my purpose here, I would like to emphasize what he uses to wiggle out of considering whether genocide occurred even in California. He turns, as many other ha have, to guess what? The virgin soil thesis. He claims that unintended epidemics had reduced California's native population by 75 to 80 percent before 1851, and then concludes that the action of these germs fundamentally discount a historical judgment that genocide occurred in California. Now, the recent debate between Madley and Anderson indeed mirrors the one between the Diné student and her professor in the Sacramento State classroom. We are thus far from being free from the obstacle that germs poses to writing genocide into narratives of American history. <laughs> 
Moreover, the dichotomy between the germ warfare or the virgin soil model pervades much of the popular understanding of indigenous history. So this dichotomy is either the colonists purposely infected natives with disease, or diseases were introduced unintentionally and spread on their own. Since there is little to no evidence for the former, then the latter must be the case. The former's association with the discredited Churchill and the latter's association with the more respected Crosby only seemingly makes the choice more obvious. What if scholars on both sides of the debate have germs wrong? And if they do, as I will argue, what are the ramifications of their misunderstandings of disease for consideration of including genocide into the moral vocabulary we use to narrate American history? As the germs versus genocide debate raged, important new scholarship has substantially revised how we understand the biological consequences of European conquest and colonization. This body of revisionist scholarship, unfortunately, has not been consulted by either side. Medical historians, archaeologists, and ethno-historians began questioning the ideas of Crosby and Dobbins soon after they published their works. And today, a rich body of scholarship exists that shows the virgin soil thesis to be deeply problematic. Now, the first um, problem with the virgin soil thesis, as been shown lately, is that there is a lack of rigor considering immunity. Now, Crosby meant that Native peoples lacked acquired immunity, but many would read into his work the notions that Native peoples lacked genetic immunity, and there is a big difference between the two. The assumption by reading genetic immunity, the assumption is that the processes of natural selection took place in Europe, in which Europeans had many generations of experience with diseases like smallpox, and somehow they developed genetic traits that allowed them to survive smallpox better than populations that had never had experience before that. The problem with that is that smallpox, like many of these common crowd diseases, have not been around in human history long enough for natural selection to do that process. Uh, smallpox is a relatively new history in human evolution. It's only been around since about 6,000 years ago, and it's, there's no scientific evidence that there's any kind of genetic immunity against smallpox. But nonetheless, you'll see this, and you'll see this today, this reference to the supposed genetic immunity. In addition, all the diseases that were brought over through the process of colonization there's a long list of them, and many of those diseases Europeans hardly had any experience with. Yellow fever, which is an African disease, for example. Cholera, which would come over in the 19th century, was a South Asian disease. Those would be as new to Europeans as they were to indigenous peoples. So lastly, on this lack of rigor, the idea that native peoples had no immunity is ludicrous. Immunity, human immunity, the immune system is a very complex system. It's your skin, it's your saliva, it's your stomach acids that ward off diseases. It's the production of white blood cells that attack invading pathogens. Indigenous immune systems were no less sophisticated than European immune systems. So to say that Native peoples had no immunity is very misleading. They certainly had immune systems. What they lacked was acquired immunity to a certain number of diseases such as smallpox. Another problem with the virgin soil thesis is this hyperinflated Imagine, I need to come up with a shorter kind of a bullet point there. Couldn't do it. Um, but it's this kind of hyperbole that surrounds the impact of diseases. And Henry Dobbins' scholarship is full of this, that somehow smallpox, once deposited in one place, spread like wildfire and hit all of the Americas, which ignores, ignores geography, settlement patterns, 
trade and intercourse patterns, things that diseases would have to navigate through to reach distant places. And there's simply a lack of evidence. This 1518 to 1526 smallpox epidemic that supposedly swept from Chile to Canada, you either believe it or you don't. There's no evidence for it. A third problem is that this scholarship, this virgin soil thesis scholarship, renders indigenous peoples only as passive victims. Their bodies, virgin bodies, succumb to disease. It assumes indigenous leaders and healers were fatalistic and took no effort to protect their people. Such assumptions ignore the medical traditions of native peoples and the ability of indigenous healers to improvise strategies to avoid contagion. And finally, there's a lack of focus on recovery um, through fertility and reproduction. Crosby and Dobbins characterized epidemics as ends in themselves. They brought native societies crumbling down, but they ignored questions of recovery from epidemics. A smallpox epidemic, to be sure, could tremendous, be tremendously devastating, could perhaps um, kill 40% of the native peoples that became infected. We do know that mortality rates of some communities approached 80 to 95 percent, though. So what happened? Indigenous peoples suffered from colonialism that per retarded fertility, decreased reproduction rates, and prevented them from recovering. Those factors, indeed, could be non-disease related, warfare, slavery, ethnic cleansing, and genocide processes that depressed female fertility and took away community members of reproductive age. Now to illustrate this revised understanding of disease, let me offer three examples of epidemics. Epidemics that are indeed intertwined with what we would call today crimes against humanity. And epidemics that produce a much darker narrative than the celebratory story, which those who strive to keep the term genocide out of the American story attempt to preserve. The first example, is the great southeastern smallpox epidemic of 1696 to 1700. Now I can illustrate this with a series of slides. So if you look at what is today the southeastern United States around 1492, what you'll see is uh, many uh, sophisticated tribal chiefdoms in the river valleys. Uh, but between these river valleys were areas which were unsafe for human travel because chieftains tend to be warring polities against each other. If Dobbins and Crosby were right, and for that matter, Jared Diamond, these chieftains would have been destroyed by this 1518 to 1526 epidemic. But when Hernando de Soto comes through in the 15. 40s, he goes from one chiefdom to the next. He sees very sophisticated polities inhabiting these regions. Moreover, this expedition was a group largely of men who you wouldn't think to be carrying common childhood diseases. The Southeast was not afflicted by smallpox until much later. They were affected by smallpox after the English began to colonize the South. First in Virginia, 1607, Jamestown is settled. By the 1640s, the Virginians are trading with native partners on the Piedmont. And what they're trading for are human captives. They're acquiring human captives from their native allies, captives that have been captured from the interior. They're initiating a slave trade. The South Carolinians escalate this process of slave taking. They establish a slave trade network that extends all the way to the Mississippi Valley. Through their allies, they're raiding native peoples of captives, sending them on this uh, trade route to Charleston where they would be sold into slavery in the West Indies. When the French arrive to establish Louisiana in 1698, 1699, the English were already there. And what they're, they're doing is buying slaves. And they're particularly buying certain types of slaves, women and children. What this slave, violent slave trade did created a shattered world, a shattered world of native peoples as refugees, fleeing gun-wielding slave raiders, and fording themselves into small compact villages out of hopefully hiding, 
fearful to go outside of their village to hunt, to gather, or even to tend their crops. It was a shatter zone in which a great deal of human trafficking, in other words, was going on. Now, if we look back at these, these slave routes, trading routes, what do you think happens when smallpox arrives at Jamestown in 1696? It enters the slave trade network and ignites a huge epidemic, a huge epidemic. This epidemic was not just merely the consequence of native peoples lacking acquired immunity. It was the consequence of a violent form of colonialism, a violent form of colonialism that transformed the region, created an unprecedented degree of human traffic, put native peoples in a very vulnerable position, living in compact nucleated villages in which they could not escape infection, and put them in a vulnerable position position to suffer high mortality because of high pathogen loads <clears throat> and trauma. The great southeastern smallpox epidemic, in other words, was not merely a virgin soil epidemic. For my next example, let me talk about a Cherokee epidemic of 1759 to 1761. This was a time in which the Cherokees were at war with their English neighbors. Uh, the Cherokees by 1759 had experience with at least smallpox and, and many other diseases. But by 1759, two things had happened. They began to rebuild their societies through incorporating captives and, and bringing in remnant groups and through reproduction. Their populations began to increase. The second thing that began to happen is they developed new medical rituals to deal with these new diseases. Uh, during my research on my dissertation, I came across this, and this was a very instrumental in for me to develop this line of thinking, so I'll give you a shot to read this while I take a drink of water. What this is is a Cherokee smallpox dance. It is a description of a ceremony that the Cherokees made part of their medical rituals at some point after being first introduced to the disease. It offered a glimpse of how the Cherokees conceived of smallpox, what they believed caused the disease, and what they did to protect themselves from the deadly germ. When smallpox was suspected to be near their villages, Cherokees performed a ceremony which involved over a week of careful preparation and specialized ritual activity. What stood out to me most was that throughout the time the ceremony lasted, participants had strict prohibitions on their movements. If people had to leave the village, they left their towns only at midnight and traveled through the woods rather than main routes. Essentially what the Cherokees were doing was cutting their villages off from contact with the outside world, a form of quarantine. Now this was something quite different from what I had been reading about in the works by Alfred Crosby and others. Now this ritual only went so far to protect the Cherokees from infection, particularly when confronted by a vengeful enemy, a vengeful enemy such as Lord Jeffrey Amherst. It would be Lord Jeffrey Amherst who would prosecute the British war against the Cherokees between 1759 and 1761. Now, some of you may know Lord Jeffrey uh, as one of the most notorious characters in colonial American history and a character often mentioned in the germs or genocide debate. Uh, so before I get into the Cherokee War, let me mention uh, why you this name Amherst probably rings a bell for you. In the summer of 1763, Shawnees, Lenapes, and Anishinaabes besieged Fort Pitt. So I'm jumping forward here a little bit. This was during uh, Pontiac's uh, so-called rebellion, in which native peoples of what is today the Midwest tried to resist the Euro uh, English expansion where the French departed after the Seven Years' War, and they captured a number of British forts and put the British on their heels. They not only captured a number of forts, but they laid siege to Fort Pitt. And while they were laying siege to Fort Pitt, Amherst sent his second-in-command, Henry Bouquet, to relieve the beleaguered forces. And when he sends them, he pens a letter to Bouquet articulating a plan of germ warfare. He asked Bouquet if there might be a means to infect the Indians. Bouquet writes back that he would try. Bouquet had never had smallpox, so he, he, he didn't really want to handle smallpox-laden material. 
So after getting Bouquet's response, Amherst approves. Approves in language that clearly resembles what we would consider genocide. Unbig notes to Amherst, though, the British in Fort Pitt had already conducted germ warfare. William Trent, a trader who traded goods with Indians before the uh, Pontiac's Rebellion, gave smallpox laden materials to visiting Lenapes. Since he was a trader, he was using his own blankets and materials. And of course, he wanted reimbursement. So what did he do? He sent his bill up the chain of command. And ultimately, it reached the, ga uh, the desk of Thomas Gage, uh, who at that time was commander of British forces, who signs off approving germ warfare. This is really the only documented case we have of germ warfare happening in North America. Now, was it typical? Did this happen more often? Certainly, Ward Churchill wanted people to believe that, and he invented evidence to try to convince people of that. But even mainstream scholars try to make the case that this was more typical, such as Elizabeth Finn in a very, um, very interesting uh, Journal of American History article published back in 2000. I am not here to dwell on this event, however. My point is that the focus on Fort Pitt has obscured more than it has revealed, especially in context of the germs or genocide debate. In popular culture, the event is often construed as evidence of what had been a more widespread practice. While critics of the view point to the lack of documentation of this practice at other times and places as support for the virgin soil thesis. An outbreak of smallpox and measles that occurred among the Cherokees during the war with the British in 1759 61, however, places germs in a more realistic context. And in this epidemic, Amherst plays an important role. So the Cherokees and British end up in war with each other in 1759. The Cherokees had been allies to the British. Uh, they helped the British uh, fight against the French and their native allies in Pennsylvania. But on their way back in the late 1750s, uh, a number of Cherokees wind up dead, killed by the English. To make a long story short, the Cherokees exacted vengeance and killed some settlers. The governor of South Carolina launches an invasion and calls for Amherst to send regular British troops. Amherst sends those regular British troops in 1760. At the time, smallpox was circulating in the back country of Carolina and had germinated in some of the lower towns of the Cherokees. Amherst ordered troops under Colonel Archibald Montgomery to take care of the Cherokees. You will punish the Indians in such manner that His Majesty's subjects may hereafter enjoy their possessions without any dread of these barbarous and inhuman savages. At the time, smallpox was lingering, and when Montgomery arrives, his troops burn down all of the lower towns, force the lower town Cherokees to flee as refugees in the middle towns and valley towns. They had been infected with smallpox and measles, and of course they carried those diseases with them into the, the greater Cherokee nation, igniting a larger epidemic. The Cherokees still resisted, Montgomery's forces retreated, and the following year, Amherst would order another invasion, this time under Colonel James Grant. Amherst called the Cherokees a perfidious and inhuman race of barbarians, and he ordered Grant to exact the most exemplary vengeance by destroying all of their towns. The general did not give orders to deliberately infect British, uh, Britain's native adversaries with smallpox, but he left no question that all Cherokees were to be made to suffer severely. Grant's forces arrived in 1761 with orders to put all souls to death, and they made quick work of the lower towns, the remaining lower towns burning those, marched into the middle towns, burnt all of those villages to the ground before um, running out of supplies and then moving back to Fort Prince George. The middle town Cherokees now are refugees. They flee into the overhills and the valley towns creating more disease. The historical record makes it clear that Amherst ordered a brutal form of warfare that had offered a wide array, that affected a wide array of Cherokees from the very young to the oldest. It was war that inflamed an epidemic. 
The war vividly demonstrates how the violence of colonialism disrupted indigenous peoples, inhibited their ability to protect themselves. Had the Cherokees wanted to perform their smallpox dance, it would be very hard to do so as refugees. And it made recovery quite difficult. So let me skip to the final example here. The Cherokees, of course, their population would rebound after the Anglo-British War. It would plummet during the American Revolution, during the violence, and would rebound substantially by the 1830s. But of course, what happened in the 1830s, they were forced to move from their homeland in the east to Indian Territory, and their population would take another hit. But it's not the Cherokees that I want to talk about. It's the Choctaws, and it's cholera. Andrew Jackson's Indian removal policy serves as the context of my third example. Cholera is often listed as one of the several diseases that came early and often with Europeans, but such listing is grossly misleading. Cholera did not cross the Atlantic until 1832. Cholera is a bacterial disease that strikes quickly. The disease depended on the advent of steam-powered shipping to make it a global health threat. It most likely had not made it into Western Europe prior to the 19th century. Needless to say, then, there was no difference between Euro-American and indigenous Americans in terms of acquired immunity. Both were essentially virgin soil populations. Now, cholera is a nasty disease. Once you acquire it, you know, acquiring it through cont sewage-contaminated water, uh, the toxin uh, uh, um, paralyzes the intestines, creating massive loss of water, massive diarrhea, that uh, would kill within 12 hours, you would die from dehydration, and your body would be uh, a bluish tent, unless you were rehydrated, which no one in the 1830s, of course, understood. But the difference between Euro-Americans and Choctaws in the 1830s is that the Choctaws were made vulnerable to the disease because of the policies of the United States government. In 1830, Andrew Jackson signed into law one, the, one of his most desired pieces of legislation, the Indian Removal Act. In the fall of 1830, a faction of the Choctaw succumbed to pressures that the Indian Removal Policy created and signed the Treaty of Dancing Rabbit Creek. This treaty allowed nearly 20,000 Choctaws to choose whether they wanted to remain in Mississippi under the state's discriminatory laws or sign up for removal. The treaty lightly mentioned any logistical detail, only stipulating that the federal government would provide transportation aboard wagons and with steamboats as may be found necessary, and one year of subsistence in Indian Territory. The journey would also occur under the care of discreet and careful persons who will be kind and brotherly to them. When the first Choctaw party arrived, there was no food, no clothing, or anything that the government agreed to provide. Amid this emerging fiasco, President Jackson addressed Congress and defended his policy as, quote, a provision too kind to deserve the stamp of injustice. The second wave of Choctaw removal during the fall of 1831 stood in stark contrast to Jackson's characterization. Choctaws were loaded aboard steamboats and then sent as far west as water could take them. Conditions aboard the boats were ghastly. Dysentery took its toll. Conditions upon arrival were deplorable. Government officials had not forwarded funds for its agents to buy food for the immigrants, and what little food that they had did they, that was obtained was rancid. To make matters worse, smallpox spread among Choctaw immigrants and ignited a larger epidemic among Western tribes. By the 1830s, of course, vaccine was widely used in the United States, but removal advocates had not thought of, ahead of time to vaccinate natives. It was not smallpox, though, that most concerned the Choctaws. It was cholera. By fall of 1832, cholera reached the Mississippi Valley where tired and hungry Choctaw immigrants gathered to be transported to Indian Territory. Boarding a steamboat almost certainly led to infection. Some Choctaws refused to board and went on foot, but many of these became stranded in the swamps and mud of the Mississippi Valley and ultimately consented to board boats. Having received news of disease's approach, white contractors refused to come through with their responsibilities to supply uh, food and medicine. Immigrants eventually wandered into Indian Territory during the winter and spring of 1830, carrying cholera with them, infecting previous arrivals, who were then enduring the harshest of conditions, and infecting resident tribes such as the Osages. Choctaws lost nearly one quarter of their people, and they would call their experience the Trail of Tears. The Trail of Tears is often just associated with the Cherokees, but it was the Choctaws that came up with that term.
Yet the fiasco did not phase the Jackson administration. They carried on with their plan to complete Choctaw removal and stepped up pressure on other indigenous nations to remove as well. In his December 1833 address to Congress, the president in fact remarked, the experiment which has been recently made has so far proved successful. He stated this as a matter of fact and without the slightest suggestion of what he fully knew. Thousands of Choctaws were then dying because of this experiment. Despite Jackson's rhetorical cover-up, the Choctaw's experience, widely reported in the press and in government correspondence, confirmed the warnings that opponents of the Indian Removal Act had made. Yet the Jackson administration carried on with this policy without any regard to the health of the Indians and continued to turn a blind eye to their death and suffering. Cholera, in other words, did not act according to a pattern that the virgin soil thesis postulated. It infected a group suffering from the policies that a consensus of historians now describe as ethnic cleansing. It's hard not to agree that ethnic cleansing occurred when Andrew Jackson himself says, and this is not the only example, that the purpose of it is, is to expel the Indians to make room for the whites. Choctaws may not have been a victim of genocide, but they certainly suffered from crimes that those who want to deny genocide have covered up with an injudicious use of the virgin soil thesis. I know I'm running really late on time, and I wanted to save some time for questions, so let me sum up. What these examples add up to then is that the violence against natives cannot be dismissed or glossed over by imagined biological events that Europeans and Euro-Americans supposedly had no agency in causing. It doesn't mean that people can just throw out the term genocide. It is a powerful term that can be purposely used to evoke moral revulsion at a number of disparate, seemingly unrelated events. It is overused and often misused, and scholars should avoid the casual use of the term. They should carefully define what they mean by genocide, examine specific cases rather than speaking in broad generalities, and compile and marshal evidence based on rigorous scholarly methods to make one's case. Through such efforts, our understanding of violence against indigenous peoples of the Americas becomes enriched and becomes part of a larger continuum, one in which colonialism's violence set in motion the ideologies, examples, and processes that tragically and catastrophically resulted in the great evil of the Holocaust, as well as other more modern genocides. The virgin soil thesis, as I hope to have shown you today, should no longer serve as an impediment to these advances. In fact, revisions to our understanding of the impact of disease make it even more important that we understand the role of violence and talk about it in broader and comparative ways. We may not agree on to the extent to which genocide happened and where it happened, but it should no longer be acceptable to simply say that diseases killed most natives and thus genocide did not occur. Hopefully, professors trained in America's research universities will no longer walk into today's diverse classrooms prepared to dismiss what happened to indigenous peoples as an unintended biological accident. Instead, we should engage our students to think of American history more critically as a history that has unfolded from countless number of violent human decisions, actions, and events. And we should indeed compare and contrast the fate of America's indigenous peoples with the peoples that have suffered genocides at other times and places in what is our collective yet often troubling story of our common humanity. Thank you.